I, we have a call and response. Remember, your, your, your part is the bold in these call and responses. That means you're the second line down. Mrs. Lovell says it's hard to see. Okay, next time, yellow for call and response. <laughs> You're, 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 the, you're the bold. All right, here we go. Uh, this is God's word. Let us worship God. He is our refuge and fortress, our God in whom we trust. Let us confess with our mouths Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Let us call upon our one true God, believing him in our hearts confessing him with our mouths, worshiping him in spirit and in truth. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we, we confess that you are our refuge and fortress this morning. Lord, when, when we are afraid, scared, hurt, the place that we need to run to is you. We need to trust in you, Lord. And so this morning we've come into your house to find refuge in you. Would you be our fortress this morning, Lord? And would you guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus? Father, would you give us hearts and lips uh, that, that proclaim Jesus is our Lord? Help us to believe in him this morning. Renew our faith, renew our zeal, renew our hope that he's gonna return again. Father, give us worshipful hearts, hearts that see Jesus, that lift him up high where he belongs, and help us to worship him in spirit and in truth. This is our heart's cry this morning, and we ask it in his name. Amen. Let's stand and sing, church.
have a seat before we greet one another around us. Amen. Let us confess our faith together as the church. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. And before I pray, with your eyes closed, your heads bowed, I just want you to pause and take a moment and reflect on your week. How and when and where did you fail in following the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Ask the Lord to bring to mind anything that you need to confess this morning to him. Heavenly Father, we confess that we have not lived as you taught us. We've put our longing for things such as money and success or happiness above our desire for you and your kingdom. We often worry about what other people will think what we wear, how our reputation can be polished. Lord, we make idols out of sports, our next promotion, the perfect family, the perfect home, the latest technology. We are careless often with our words. We say things we don't mean, things that hurt others such as our children and our friends. We are so busy, Lord, with our lives that we forget that every breath we have is from you. We waste time, Lord, on meaningless activities, failing to recognize every moment is a gift of grace. We often indulge in hateful thoughts against those we feel have offended us, We're often indifferent to the, those that suffer around us. We regularly forget that all people are image bearers of you. In an effort to look and feel better, we often compare ourselves to others. We can and do take advantage of weakness and are passive in the face of injustice. Sometimes, Lord, for personal gain and reputation, we can lie blatantly and by omission. Lord, we confess we'd rather blame others unjustly than accept our own fault. We long for what is not ours, and we begrudge the blessings that you bestow upon others. So, Lord, we ask for your forgiveness this morning that we think about ourselves before we think about you. We ask that you'd free us, though, Lord, of having unreasonable expectations, both of ourselves and others. Free us from the need to compete. Free us from a loss of perspective, Lord, so that we might glorify you in all that we do and say and think. In Jesus' name. Amen. The joy 
<laughs> of confessing sin is that we can be sure that God accepts it. Uh, if our hearts truly confess our sin to the Lord, you can be positive that Jesus Christ has atoned and cleansed you from your sin. I love 2 Corinthians 5.21. God made him, Jesus, to be sin, who knew no sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God. <laughs> so all of that sin that we just laid before the altar, it's on Jesus. He said, I'll pay for that. And guess what you and I get this morning? His righteousness, his perfect life. It's called the great exchange. So praise God that he is so gracious. He just gives us all of his own righteousness. And so it's freeing to just confess and own it because God says, I know and I love you. So then we go from here having received grace and we live lives full of grace, don't we? We don't, we don't live by the law anymore. We live by grace because a perfect Savior laid down his life for us. Well, let us go in that spirit. Greet one another. Kids, you're dismissed to Sunday school. All righty. I invite you to take your seats, church. <laughs> All righty. Wonderful. All right. <clears throat> I'd like to invite the, the ushers forward uh, to take our tithes and offerings. Once again, uh, God has really blessed this church through you. I just want you to know that uh, we're, doing, we're doing well. God has continued to provide for us, and that is just his grace alone. So thank you for partnering in this ministry. Uh, if you're visitors or guests, obviously, we just want you to be blessed. And again, church, if you have prayer requests, they're on the back of those things for a reason. We'd love to pray for you, and we'd love to keep them in the, in the circle that you want them left in. So if you just want me to know it, or if you just want the elders, or you want the whole church to be praying for you, just let us know. All right, let's pray. Father. Lord, I thank you for these, uh, these brothers that usher every, every Sunday, Lord, and serve in this way. I just look down upon them and, and thank you for them, God. Thank you that they love to serve you. 
Thank you for all the servants of this church that give of their time and talents and energy. We are grateful, God, that we have one another to do, uh, to do life with, to follow you in this, in this world together with, Lord. And that's what we want is to be a church that brings others into this community of faith and walks alongside us to follow Jesus. So, Lord, the, the funds that we give are towards that end. We want to be a blessing. It is more blessed to give than to receive. And so, Lord, we want to give away not only our, our time and our talents, but even our treasures, Lord. Use these uh, tithes and offerings to glorify your name here and to the ends of the earth. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And now Ms. Jen's going to do announcements. Good morning. So, uh, for the announcements this week, youth group has started back. They are in session. That's on Thursday nights. If you're not already sending your kiddos, you should. Um, it starts at 6.30 and runs till about 8 o'clock. Uh, next up, we don't have a slide for this, but it's, um, it's actually next week, and I'm so excited. I didn't realize it. October's next week already. Well, no, wait a minute. Next weekend. So, yeah, we have one more Sunday in September which is Family Sunday. So um, the women's retreat is October 4th through the 6th in Camp Orchard Hill in Pennsylvania. If you're interested and you want more information, you can connect with Tiffany. Uh, next up, we have Soup for the Soul. Um, this is uh, the ministry that's been running for a couple of months now. And I know personally, a few of my friends have benefited from this. And um, if you have somebody that you know is in need or if they're struggling, just coming back from the hospital, a death in the family, if you can reach out to Janet, Donna, or Sue, they will connect with that person and send them a meal, a really good hearty meal. Uh, we still have the Swansons as our family to pray for, our missionaries. They work out of Trans World Radio. And this is the final week for small group signups. The signups are in the back, and um, we have three different nights. Wednesday is run by Nick at 7 o'clock. Thursday is Bruce and Janet at 6. And Friday is Ray and Christine. Do you guys know when yours is going to start roughly yet? OK. <laughs> so sign up in the back. And uh, with that, let's open up our Bibles and get into the reading this morning. Um, if you want, you can use the new Bibles, page 1045. This is chapter 19, starting at verse 47. And he was teaching daily in the temple. The chief priests and the scribes and the principal men of the people were seeking to destroy him. But they did not find anything they could do, for all the people were hanging on his words. One day, as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel, the chief priests and the scribes with the elders came up and said to him, tell us by what authority you do these things, or who it is that gave you this authority. He answered them, I also will ask you a question. Now tell me, was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? And they discussed it with one another, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why did you not believe him? But if we say from man, all the people will stone us to death, for they are conceived that convinced that John was a prophet. So they answered that they did not know where it came from. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. All right. <clears throat> Thanks, Jen. <laughs> Wonderful. All right, we're, we're back in Luke. Last week, we, uh, we ended with Jesus cleaning house. If, if you weren't here, Jesus en entered what is known as the court of the Gentiles. It's, it's a part of the temple complex. It's a massive space where they would sell the animals for sacrifice and where they would exchange money. And Jesus came into the temple, having come down from the east side of the mount to Jerusalem, and he 
cast out all those that were selling inside of it. And what we noticed last week from our study was that this act of cleansing the temple was a prophetic act. It was Jesus' way of identifying himself in the line of the prophet Jeremiah. You see, because 700 years before Jesus came, Jeremiah was in the, in the first temple, and he was calling them to repent, or else that temple would be destroyed. And surely it was destroyed. And now Jesus, 700 years later, is in the rebuilt temple, and he's quoting Jeremiah, saying, you've made my house a den of robbers, so watch out, the temple is going to be destroyed. It was a prophetic act on his part. That was one of the reasons he cleansed the temple. But there was another reason he cleansed the temple. And we see it immediately in verse 47 that Jen just read, where it says he was teaching in the temple daily. Right? Jesus cleans house, he cleansed the temple because class needed to be in session. Right? Jesus essentially said, I'm reclaiming my father's house for his divine purposes, which is to teach the way of God to anyone and everyone who has ears to hear. And that's where Jesus is going to be. For the next two chapters, he's going to be in the court of the Gentiles preaching the way of God to anyone that would hear him. And what Luke does in verses 47 to 48 is he foreshadows what that's going to entail. And what it's going to entail is conflict. Look at those verses. The chief priests and the scribes and the principal men of the people were seeking to destroy him, but they did not find anything they could do for all the people were hanging on his words. Now what, what you need to see there is the drastic division that Jesus is creating through his ministry and presence. Do you see that he's created division between these two groups? It's black and white. And that division that Jesus creates should not surprise us because he told us in Luke chapter 12, don't think that I've come to give peace on earth. No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, in one house there will be five divided, three against two, and two against three. His message is a dividing line amongst people. And what's also fascinating is this division that he was going to create was prophesied by an elderly man in the temple named Simeon. So Jesus, back when he's a little itty bitty baby, you remember? He's brought to the temple by his parents to be uh, to go through all of the, the ritual sacrifices and things like that. And Simeon says, Lord, my time's finally come. My eyes have seen your salvation. And he picks up baby Jesus in the same temple only 30 years earlier. And this is what he says. Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel. You hear the division that this child is creating. Some will fall on account of him and some will rise up. And he even says to Mary, this will be like a sword that pierces through your soul because he's coming and he's going to die and he's going to reveal the thoughts of many. So Jesus came to bring division and we're, we're going to focus on these two groups, right? There are two groups that Luke wants us to see this morning. The first is the latter group. It's simply all the people. Do you see it in the scriptures and on, on the, the screen? All the people. All the people likely means all the Jews, both near and far who'd come, as well as the Gentiles, both who came from far and who were near, men and women. It's, it's the masses of people who've come to the temple to seek the one true God. And Luke says of these people, they're hanging on his words. Now that's a fascinating word. Only one time in the Bible it's used and it's right here. It's amazing. Josephus, that Jewish historian, though, he uses this word in some of his writing where he's recounting a famine that the Jews experienced. They experienced a famine on, the, on account of Rome coming in and taking control. And he's explaining how the famine got so bad, so bad that people would steal 
anyone's food. Whoever they could steal food from to survive, they would. And then he says, even from, quote, children clinging. That's that same word, hanging. Even stealing food from children hanging to morsels of bread. So think about that for a minute. What is Luke saying? He's saying all the people were clinging to the words of Jesus like it was their last morsel of bread. The teaching of Jesus that he was giving them was like sustenance for the famine, the famished ones. All the people were starved for good news, and they're literally clinging to Jesus' word. You could not get them to leave. They were really into it. But that's not the case for that other group. Verse 47, the chief priests and the scribes and the principal men of the people, well, they were seeking to kill him. So, so you got this one group, they're hanging on every word, and this other group wants to hang him. Do you see the, the, the distinction? He's created this division. Who are these people? Well, we talked about it last week a little bit. The chief priests were drawn from a group called the Sadducees. They were the religious aristocracy. So they, they had power through their lineage, right? Because they were in the line of the priests. So that meant that they oversaw all of those ritual sacrifices at the temple. They were the intermediaries between these, this group of all the people and God. They were the ones that controlled that whole thing. And they were super rich because they were a part of the aristocracy. So they have cultural power. They have religious power. And we see that there's the scribes. Who are the scribes? They were experts in the Old Testament, in the law. So where did their power come from? They could say, I know the book better than you. This is what the book says. This is what you should do. Because I'm the authority. I know the book. And then there were the principal men. It's literally the first ones. And what that means is these were the lay leaders of the whole community. They were rich and powerful and connected. So here you've got this group, this, these three groups, and these are the three groups that make up the one group called the Sanhedrin. All right, what's the Sanhedrin? 71 men who sat on, the, on this council, and they were essentially the Supreme Court and the papacy <laughs> and the, the elite of our culture all wrapped into one. They had all the religious, cultural, and social power in that entire community. And it's those people that want Jesus dead. It's fascinating what James Edwards says about this group. He's a commentator. Here's what he says. Opposition to the messianic mission, that is to Jesus, does not come from humanity at its worst, but from humanity at its best. From those knowledgeable about God and authorized to serve in God's house. Now that should give everyone pause, right? Because these are people, their whole lives are devoted to drawing near to God. And you're here on Sunday morning when you could be a million other places. So you, you've devoted yourself in some measure to drawing near to God. So this is directly calling us to watch ourselves. Because proximity to God didn't mean that they weren't ruthlessly going to kill Jesus. That is just mind-blowing. It should shock us that this group of people would have hearts so hardened to God's Messiah that they will kill him. And it begs the question, why? What was it about Jesus that made them so mad that they killed him? You ever wonder that? I wondered that this week. And Daryl Bach, our trusty commentator, helped me think through it a little bit. Here's, here's what he said. Those who had a stake in the community's success as currently configured were not interested in any reforms, in any efforts at reform. Okay, so let's think about this. The heart behind their hatred of Jesus and the reason that they rejected him is because he rocked the comfortable boat that they sat in. 
Does that make sense? The community's set success, they didn't want reforms because as it was currently structured, everything was awesome. Everything was great. They had the perfect setup. And what Jesus' message was, was, hey, this gospel, this great reversal, it lifts up them that are struggling to stay afloat in the water, and it puts them in these people's boat. It levels the playing field between them and others. It closes the power gap. And they said, no way. We love the fact that we have this social and cultural and religious distance. We love the feeling of being powerful and of them needing us and them looking to us and saying, oh, they have it all. We think they're amazing. The status quo had served this group for so long, they hated Jesus for the fact that he was going to mess with it. Now, if that's the case, I thought about the civil rights movement. Think about the civil rights movement. There were a bunch of professing Christians throughout the 20th century who could and did or at least remained unconcerned about civil rights in this nation. The status quo had served them. The power differential had served them. And so when civil rights activists began to push on this and say, no, this isn't right, what'd they say? We're under attack. Our way of life is under attack. Look at what they're trying to do. And while these Christians believed they were serving God and they gathered in churches on Sundays, they were actually opposing Jesus because his gospel lifts up those that are pressed down, doesn't it? It's the great reversal. And they hated it. I told you I was going to get political. So those who had a stake in the community's success as configured were not interested in reforms. And I have a question for you, something to consider. Could the same pattern be happening today with professing Christians, only now it's the foreigner and the strangers in our midst? Could it be that our views of immigrants are shaped far more by the political narrative than the biblical narrative? Because the biblical narrative of strangers and sojourners in the midst of the people of God? Well, it looks like this. Quote, when a foreigner resides among you in your land, do not mistreat them. The foreigner residing among you must be treated as your native born, equal status, like they're an American. Love them as yourself. For you were foreigners in Egypt. I am the Lord, your God. That's a far cry from what I'm hearing from many professing Christians today. How can that happen? How can that happen? Well, it's simple. You consume hours upon hours upon hours of your, your primary social media stuff or your primary television network, and you only consume a few minutes of the Bible. It's easy. What's going to take more weight in your mind and heart? A few seconds in the Bible or hours upon hours watching whatever or listening to whatever? You're, you're going to get conformed to the image of the thing that you give attention to. And so often in this culture, what I hear online and in posting is so far from this image of loving the foreigner and stranger, it boggles my mind. It, it's just unbelievable. You can see I'm passionate about this because it's truly something that the church is missing. To love the foreigner and the stranger. To, to sound like Christ when we talk about Haitians that have moved into one of our states and not just make up things that they're eating pets, and then to say it's okay to lie about that because it, then we get to own the libs. 
right? That, that's, that's the excuse. I can break the ninth commandment because it means we'll win against the liberals. That is not a Christian perspective. All right, I'm off that soapbox. Moving on. Verses 47 to 48 have set the context, right? Jesus is in the temple. He is the good guy. And the religious leaders who don't want their boats rocked are those that are against him. And you have the crowds that are loving what they're hearing because it's lifting them up when they've been held down for so long. Verse 20, or chapter 20, verse 1. One day as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel, the chief priests and the scribes of the elders came up and said to him, tell us by what authority you do these things or who it is that gave you the authority. So the conflict that was brewing in their hearts has now come out into the open. Conflict with the king is going to be the story from here on out. Each successive week for five weeks, the story will be a conflict with Jesus from these folks. And again, I don't know if you noticed, but Luke emphasizes this triumvirate. That means these three powerful groups, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. This is the Sanhedrin. It's hard to fathom in our day how intense this is, right? How, what gravity being approached by these men would have in that moment. The best I could do is thinking about if I were to go to Yankee Stadium and I were just to let myself in and go down onto the field and just, I'm just going to play. I just feel like playing. And then Aaron Judge comes out. That's the Yankees' best player. Uh, and, and then you've got Brian Cashman, the general manager, and you've got Harold Steinbrenner, the owner. And they all come out and they approach me and they say, what do you think you're doing here? Who, who let you in here? We certainly didn't let you in here. And this is our house. How would you feel in that moment? I feel about this big. Certainly I would have sweat stains through my shirt. My heart would be pounding. I would feel so insecure and afraid, and I would want to just bolt. Because those folks that own that place are telling me, you don't belong here. That's an intense situation. That's how I would feel. But Jesus did not feel that way at all. He is not intimidated in the slightest Right? He knows this is my father's house. And here's what he knows. He knows that he's the beloved son in whom he is well pleased, in whom God is well pleased. And I just thought about that. I'm like, I'm so wishy-washy with everything. I don't know about y'all, but it's hard for me to hold my ground sometimes. How do we hold our ground and our convictions and our callings? And I thought about this because here's the thing. Those voices that were coming at Jesus... You don't belong here. What are you doing here? Just quit whatever you're doing. Just stop. Every Christian is going to hear that at some point. You're going to be attacked in your mind and in your heart, right? Probably because of some past trauma that Satan's going to latch onto along with the weakness of your flesh. And he's going to cast arrows at your soul. And they're going to sound like, who do you think you are? trying to do X, Y, or Z for God. How, how can you think that you're qualified to do that? You should probably just quit before you try your hardest and embarrass yourself. Those lies will come to you. And they probably are in some measure. How do you stand up to those thoughts? Well, you do what Jesus did and you sit down and you receive the identity that he's given you. The identity he's given you is the identity that God the Father gave him. If you are in Christ, you are a beloved son or daughter in whom he is well pleased. And you need to sit with that and you need to chew on that and you need to live in that and we, church, need to remind each other of that. Because when things get hard and the road gets tough, we want to be faithful, don't we? We don't, we don't want to give up. We want to, we want to fight the good fight of faith. So Jesus answered them, I will ask you a question. Tell me, was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? Remember, Jesus is a rabbi, right? 
He was trained as a rabbi. This is Rabbi 101. When you get asked a question, you ask another question, right? We, when we talked about this in the past, Jesus asked like 300 questions in the New Testament. He answers three. So this is very much a part of his training as a rabbi. And he asks a fascinating question. What does this mean? Why, what is this deal with John? Why does he ask it? Well, let's think about it. What does he mean? Was this baptism from heaven or from man? What does he mean by baptism? What he's saying is, was the entirety of John's ministry given by God or not? Right? Because what was John's ministry? He went around and he said, repent, 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 and what? Be baptized to prepare for the Messiah. And so Jesus is saying, was John's whole ministry as preparing for me, the Messiah, was that from God or was that just made up in his own mind? Was John a true prophet, which they would have to listen to, or was he a false prophet? That's what he's asking them. Now, why would Jesus ask that question? What, what's the big deal? Well, we have to remember, John and Jesus are linked together, right? John is the last greatest prophet preparing for the Messiah. He prepared the way for Jesus. And did you notice in Luke's early chapters, he makes this point through the structure of his book. Luke is a great writer. So remember, we open the book and we get a little intro, and then what do we get first? The prophecy of John's birth. What do we get second? The prophecy of Jesus' birth. What do we get third? John and Jesus meet in utero, and, and John does backflips in his mama's belly because he's so excited to see the Messiah, and then John is born, and then Jesus is born. What is he doing with that structure? He's saying, these two men are linked together. They're inseparable. And then John baptizes Jesus in the Jordan River. So Jesus knows, and he's, he's calling them out, and he's saying, hey, me and John, we're linked together. But that's not all. John was explicit that he was lesser and Jesus was greater. You remember that? He must become greater and I must become less. That's an amazing prayer to pray, by the way. But what does he say? Uh, Luke 3. As the people were in expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ. So, Jesus, so John comes on the scene first and everyone's like, this could be the Messiah. We're so excited. This could be the Messiah. But John said, no, no, no. I baptize you with water. But he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandal I'm not worthy to untie, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So Jesus links himself to John because they're inseparable and because John was preparatory for Jesus. And Jesus is greater than John. And so what he's doing is he's saying, hey, if you have to decide on John, and if you decide on John, it's going to be a decision about me because they're inseparable. Does that make sense? Okay, so Jesus is a genius. If you don't take away anything from this sermon, Jesus is the wisdom of God. He's the most wise man to ever walk the earth because he was God. And he trips these guys up. Verse 5. Well, they started discussing it. Remember, these are the scholars of scholars. They're the ones that everybody else is going to go and say, tell me what the Bible means, please. T show me how to live for God, please. And they're like, well, if we say from heaven, he's going to say, why didn't you believe him? But if we say from man, all the people are going to kill us because they really believe John was a prophet. So they said they just didn't know where it came from. Right? So <laughs> all of a the sudden, their hearts are beating faster. They're the ones sweating through their undergarments because they're like, this is not a happy place to be. We've been put into a rock and a hard place, and both of my options are no good. We don't want any of these. Again, they can't say John was a true prophet because Jesus is going to say, why didn't you believe him? Because here's the thing. They did not go out and get baptized by John. They refused to. But here's the thing. If they didn't do that and he really was, let's say they said, okay, we do believe he was. 
now, what does that say? That these leaders who are supposed to know the way and the will of God, they missed God's preparation for the Messiah and they explicitly refused it, right? And that's like, that's too, too much shame. They, they couldn't bear that shame. That was too much humble pie. There's like, no, I can't stomach the fact that I could have been wrong, that I could have missed it. What would that do to my reputation? But also, what would that do for me right now in front of this man named Jesus? What would that mean? Well, it would mean that they would have to confess Jesus too, right? Remember, John saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the guy of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. He's like, he's before me in time and in value. I've seen and borne witness that he is the Son of God. So they can't right now say, yeah, John was a prophet. Because to acknowledge that would mean that they had to accept Jesus. And as much as they feared shame of maybe getting John wrong, what they feared more was having to surrender to the Savior in that moment. It's just too much humility. They did not want to be brought down from their perch down to the level of all those other Gentiles and all those other regular folks. And on the other hand, who wants to be stoned to death? Nobody. Nobody wants to be stoned to death. And here's the thing. In keeping with the day and time, if, if they were to blaspheme a, a true prophet, that could have resulted in death. No, no, no doubt about it. Like, if those people really thought that is a true prophet of God, they are blaspheming a man of God, and they really could have been stoned. So they're, they're not overthinking this. They see what's going to happen. So... They feared having to, they wanted to save face and they wanted to save their skins. And so what'd they do? They took that political off-ramp of no comment. No comment, we're, just, we're out of here. We're not, we're not answering this, no comments. To which Jesus in a very funny way says, well, I'm not gonna tell you by what authority I am doing these things. Now, why does he do that? Is he copping out? Is he saying, well, I'm just, you're not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. No. We, what we have to understand is that Jesus' heart was open to anyone who was truly looking for the truth. Right? And he made it clear because he knows their hearts, they were not interested in the truth at all. They were just interested in keeping their power. There's a text in Matthew 7, and Jesus told his disciples, Do not give dogs what are holy, nor give pearls to swine. And that's what Jesus did. He said, I'm just going to keep giving the pearls of my teaching to this mass of people who are okay being humble and receiving my word. And he just left it there. Well, how do we respond to this altercation, this initial questioning of Jesus' authority? Three ways. The first way I thought about is, when your blood begins to boil, ask yourself what you're loving. So, I guarantee we're all going to find ourselves upset this week. It just happens. We're human. Something's going to rub us the wrong way. We're going to get hot under the collar. We're going to get mad or frustrated. And that's exactly what happened with the religious leaders, wasn't it? But here's the thing. Your emotions and my emotions evidence our heart's affections. Your emotions if you trace them back to their source, will show you what you are loving. And that's exactly what we did with these religious leaders, right? We traced their hate and anger back to their love of status and wealth and position of authority. And we're no different. We have emotions, and what we need to do this week is trace them back to their source. So when you find yourself getting angry, mad, defensive, or sullen and withdrawn. Because some of us go forward in anger and some of us pull back. When you find yourself experiencing these emotions, ask yourself, why am I doing what I'm doing? 
Why am I feeling the way I'm feeling? Am I loving the Lord with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, and my neighbor as myself, or am I loving myself? And you'll be able to see what your heart is truly loving in that moment. There is a place for righteous anger, but at least I know in my own life, 99.9% .9 of my anger is not that righteous. It's because somebody's attacking my idol of comfort or approval or something like that. So when you do this, you're going to get a clear understanding of why the Bible says that we all fall short of the glory of God and we're sinners. Because you're going to see the root of sin, which is self-love and selfishness. And when you do this, you're going to find out how much Jesus loves you. Because you're going to see, despite all of this junk in here, Jesus knew it all. And he came and he died for all of this. He covered me. Who doesn't want to know the love of Jesus more this week? I know I do, but it's counterintuitive. We have to look at the reality of who we are to see the love of Jesus. So that's the first thing. Ask what you're loving. Number two, give Jesus Christ all authority. Right? The, the issue at the crux of this conflict is a question of, does Jesus deserve my authority or not? And the point Luke's going to make for the next five chapters or so is, Yes, he has all authority, right? Remember what he said when he was raised, all authority is given to me, right? Go therefore and make disciples. So Jesus has all authority. And I wondered, what could it look like if I gave Jesus all authority in my life? Right? Like, I, I hope you know I want to do that, but it's hard. And so I started thinking, well, maybe I could run through a day with them of what that would look like, but that would take like hours to go through all of the little scenarios. So I just want to, I just want to brainstorm with you my first hour of the day. What if, and maybe this will resonate with you, what if we gave Jesus all of our authority? All right? So think about it. I know how my day often starts. I'm woken up before my alarm. Not because I want to. But because Owen and Reed and Elliot are fighting over Tiffany's phone. Because Tiffany has Baseball 9 on that phone. And they love Baseball 9 so much that they'll fight each other over it. And so I'm woken up to kids screaming. And in my heart, I want to yell at them. From upstairs in, in the parsonage, with those holy walls, I want to yell, oh, get up here. And I want to make them feel like you're not doing right. You're, you're disappointing me, right? I, wanna, I want to discipline them in my anger. So that's my very first experience. But what if Jesus was my authority? He is, but what if I lived like it? Well, then I'd be like, oh yeah, Nick, Ephesians 6, 4, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training instruction of the Lord. And so then I'd get up and I'd walk down there and I'd say, boys, I need the phone. Can we talk about how we're respectful of people still sleeping and how we don't need to love this more than one another? And maybe I'd even pray over them and ask God to do that in their life, and then I'd kiss them on the forehead. What a order of magnitude difference that morning to my original Jesus is my authority in theory would look, right? But then I go get coffee because I'm up early now and I need coffee. And I go and I sit out on the patio out there. And I'm like, oh, finally. And I pull up my phone and I swipe right because the news is all right there on the right. And I just feel like I have to know what's going on in our world. But the Holy Spirit's like, Nick, is Jesus your authority or not? And I'm like, yeah. And he says, well, man does not live by bread alone, but by the very word of God. And Mary and Martha, didn't you remember that story? Where, where Mary gave her better portion and Jesus said, like, she's doing the right thing. And I'm like, oh, yeah, Jesus has my authority. And so I put that little device away and I pull out my Bible and I give Jesus some time. My day is now looking way different, right? I'm not beating myself for the sin that I committed against my children. I've now abided in Jesus with his word. And then chaos starts because I can't believe we're going to add another one to this chaos. But the frenzy of getting kids ready for school is in full force now. And I'm finishing up with my quiet time. I've had my cup of coffee. And Tiffany comes down. 
and she gets her cup of coffee and she gets her devotional and she sits down next to me and i'm like i love you so much i really wish though that you could have made us breakfast because if you're here that means i'm in there making breakfast and dealing with the zoo and i kind of oh it kind of makes me mad but just wake up with me so that i don't have to do all that other stuff right but then i think oh crud jesus is my authority Jesus has all authority. And he said, Nick, love your wife as Christ loved the church by laying down your life for her. And do it, he said, without grumbling or complaining. Oh, man. Because Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. And it's more blessed to give than to receive. And I'm like, okay, Jesus is my authority. And this is not easy, but the Spirit of God is reminding me, Jesus is my authority. And so I go and I don't make her feel guilty or shame about the fact that she wants a cup of coffee and to spend time with Jesus. And I happily get my kids ready for school. That's an hour, friends. That is one hour of not just saying Jesus has my authority, but living it. Imagine, just imagine, what if we did that for 24 hours? I guarantee you there would be other family members other coworkers, other friends that would be in here telling stories of so-and-so's crazy. They just keep doing really kind stuff and serving and something's got into them, right? And you'd have stories too of joy. I guarantee you, it's more blessed to give than to receive. I know it, Jesus said it. And so what if we just gave Jesus all authority? And when we failed, we give him authority and we repent. Because he said, hey, just confess. And you get to move on freely. You don't, get to, you don't have to hang under the weight of your failure. Number three, live your good confession. Right? These religious leaders, their confession was, John is not a prophet, wasn't it? But when push came to shove, when it meant their heads, they're like, meh, I don't know. These religious leaders show us how to not have a good confession. We are called, though, as Christians, to live out our good confession. Paul tells Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of eternal life to which you are called and which you made a good confession in the presence of many witnesses. So here's the deal. When you were baptized, if you've been baptized, you made a good confession in front of many witnesses. Right? Baptism is your ultimate confession. It is your confessing to the masses that Jesus is mine and I am his. And I've died to my old life. I've died to my sin. I'm being buried with Christ. I want that old person who's not under the authority of Jesus to be buried and I'm going to walk in newness of life. That's our confession. We're raised to walk in newness of life. And so, no matter what, Christian, remain faithful to your good confession, simply because your good shepherd is ever faithful to you. At the end of the day, he's faithful. And with his grace, we can do that together. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for Jesus not being afraid, for knowing who he was as your son and Lord, that's my prayer for us, is that we would know who we are. We would know whose we are, that we belong to you, that you've called us, you've claimed us as your own, you've spoken those words over us. And Lord, would that reality of that depth of that love make it a joy to give Jesus all authority? <laughs> Lord, even when it feels impossible and it feels like a death to give up ourselves for others, would you remind us that you, Jesus, willingly gave yourselves up, yourself up for us? And would that help us through the spirit who dwells within us to live this life for Jesus? Father, I pray that we wouldn't question his authority. I ask, Lord, that we would love the stranger and sojourner in a radically different way than our culture often does. 
Lord, help us not just to talk about these things, but to live them. Help us to make a good confession, both in what we say and how we think and what we do. And thank you for grace when we fail. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand and sing. Now to him who is able to keep us from stumbling and to present us blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be to him glory and majesty, dominion and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. <laughs>